The following is a local resident producer's program. The program content is the sole responsibility of the producer and does not necessarily reflect the views or policies of Oshkosh Media, the City of Oshkosh, or Time Warner Cable. everybody, welcome to another episode of Ion Oshkosh. I'm your host, Cheryl Hentz, and we've got a jam-packed show for you tonight. Um, jam-packed with people, jam-packed with dogs, and um, that in and of itself should be exciting. Um, we are joined tonight by Brenda Siricioni. Did I pronounce that correctly? Yes. All right, yay, we're already off to a good start. She is the president and lead trainer for a group called Journey Together Service Dog, Inc. And so right off the bat, you ought to be able to tell that this is going to be a show featuring service dogs. But not just service dogs. These are service dogs that are being trained in our local prison for work with people who have PTSD. And um, so I'm also joined uh, to my left is Sherry. Um, and because of some of the nature of the work with prisons and so forth, um, some of the folks have elected to just use their first names only, and that's perfectly fine. So Sherry is to my right. I think I said left. It's my right. <laughs> and and uh, to her right is Cindy, and uh, they have some dogs with them. We'll be showing the dogs a little bit uh, later on. Right now, though, um, I want to thank all of you for being here. Um, thank you for having us. And yes. for the dogs to be here as well. I know that this is, having dogs myself, I know what it is to transport some dogs. <laughs> and you've brought in more than, more than uh, the number of dogs that I have tonight. So, But you've got a lot more people, too. So. <laughs> So thanks for being here. So tell us, you're the president, so I'm going to defer to you on this. How, first of all, you've had a name change in yes. like the last, what, year? Yep, yep. We're, we're a little bit over a year old. Uh, we, start, well, we started last year in spring, <coughs> and we received some help um, from Sister Pauline Quinn, who has an organization called Pathway, Bridges and Pathways. And part of that, um, we became Bridges and Pathways of Courage to start with. And as we got up and we got going, um, we started to be in a position where we could stand on our own two feet. And um, the community volunteerism grew to the point and we had enough support that we could become our own organization. And with that organization, we set up our own board of directors and we've been able to get going from there. Okay. So what was the impetus for starting the organization? Why? So about three and a half years ago, we started a program at the Oshkosh Prison where they were raising guide dogs. They were raising guide dogs for Occupy's organization, and what we found was there were more inmates at the prison that were interested in working with the program than Occupy's was going to be in a position to place at Oshkosh. So to start that, um, we started a second program up, and that's what caused us to start the service dog program up, uh, specifically for working with those with PTSD, be they victims of crime or be they... Um, somebody, a veteran, or um, just somebody who's had something bad happen in their life and they need the help of a dog. Do they actually have to have a medical diagnosis of having PTSD? We, um, our mission says that we will place a dog with anybody who would be qualified to have a service dog. Our intent is to place dogs that, for people that do have PTSD. We also look for those people that are current, they should be currently in treatment in addition to getting the dog, because that could add more stress as opposed to helping somebody. Okay. And I've, I've been on your website, and we're going to be putting that up um, throughout the show, but I've been on it, 
and it's very informational. You've also got a Facebook page, mm -hmm. and um, you know people can just go to. We didn't. There's not enough room, obviously, there to put everything up there. So um, just go to Facebook and click in. Um, you know the mm -hmm. the name of the group, uh, and you can find everything. But on your Facebook page, you have a vision and you have a mission. Mm -hmm. um, can you just kind of briefly tell us what your mission and vision is for the group? So we have, um, we have kind of a multi-part mission and vision. So we, it could get too long if we put it all in words, but <laughs> our intent is to raise and train highly um, qualified service dogs to help people. The dogs start helping people the day they enter the prison. They help the inmates as far as they're learning how to handle dogs, they're learning training skills that they might use when they leave the prison system, and they're learning how to interact with each other and how to teach. The dogs are all trained there. They also have all their care taken up, um, done by the inmates. So the inmates do the bathing, the toenails, the feeding. Um, if a dog's on medication, the inmates are accountable for ensuring that the dogs are getting their feeding and the medication at the proper time. When the dogs um, are ready to start going out into public, we have community volunteers who take the dogs out. So the dogs then are starting to help in the community as far as um, people really appreciate this mission. They appreciate being able to help others in a small way. So the dogs go out in public. The, um, we do presentations, um, sometimes for church groups, sometimes for schools, um, Boy Scouts and 4-H and things like that. So we're able to take the dogs and help those people understand proper service dog etiquette and how to deal with the dog. And then lastly and most importantly, it's when the dog is actually placed and we have somebody that is receiving that dog. Um, that is probably the coolest experience you can have. When you can see that dog make a difference for somebody and when the dog starts bonding with that person and steps away from you and says, I knew you, but that's okay, this is my person now. Mm -hmm. um, that's really where it's kind of at for us in the end. Sure. Um, I, I think as it is with anyone who adopts out dogs, mm -hmm. you know, uh, whether it's an animal shelter or a rescue group, you know, people say, well, how can you have that animal in your home for so long and then give it up? Mm -hmm. And it's because it's going to a home where it's really needed, mm -hmm. whether it's for companionship or service or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so do you, do you follow the dogs then after they've yeah, gone absolutely. into the homes? Um, part of our um, intention is to become affiliated with Assistance Dogs International. And that is intended, um, they have standards of care, standards of training, and then standards with, that you work with your clients on. These dogs are our responsibility for the life of the dog. So in the beginning, when somebody's getting a dog, we spend a lot more time with them. We're training them. We're making sure that they and the dog are a good fit. As the dog grows up and as they get ready to go, um, we spend less and less time with them, but certainly it's every month for the first six to nine months, and then it'll become annual at a minimum. But what we're finding is the people that we're placing dogs with are staying very connected with us. They're helping us with fundraising. They're helping us um, get the word out as well. Sure. So we have so constant contact. that's their contact. way of kind of yep. paying, paying it forward, exactly. paying it back, whatever. Exactly. Okay. Now, um, how... I've got so many questions about how dogs are selected, what breeds are typically used. Um, we've got, I think folks can kind of see there's a couple different dogs laying on the floor here, and we've got some others here tonight as well. Um, when I think, well, here, let's start here. What is the difference for folks to really understand between a service animal and a companion animal that's not just like my dog that's a companion animal mm -hmm. and a member of my family, but a companion animal that maybe goes with people because they panic easily or whatever. Because there is a difference there, mm -hmm. right? So a service dog <coughs> has um, public access rights under Americans with Disabilities Act. A service dog is intended to provide service for the person who's holding the leash. So in this case, this is a dog in training but her job is to stick with me and help me and do things for me. A therapy dog, like you might see in a hospital or, um, or an assisted living center, for example, that's a case where the dog that's on the other end of the leash is there to help the other person. So those dogs don't have public access rights. They have to be granted access to the institution that you're helping and that you're working mm -hmm. with. So for instance, my personal dog is a registered therapy dog. So she and I would go and make visits, but her job is to take care of other people. My job is to make sure that she's safe and that she doesn't 
um, trip on a cord and, and you'll cause mm -hmm. some sort of other issue. So, but it's who they're supposed to help. That brings you right into the whole concept of when do you pet a dog, mm -hmm. right? A therapy dog is intended to go visit people. The ter therapy dog will leave me to go to visit the other person. Those are the dogs you pet. Because this dog that's on the end of my leash is a service dog and you see me in the grocery store, for example, that's not a dog that you pet because she's supposed to stay focused on me, think about me, and take care of me. And I want to talk about that in a little bit, but there was, um, <coughs> I flew out to Arizona a couple of years ago <coughs> and in the seat next to me uh, was a gentleman and his wife and they had a dog actually on their lap in the cabin um, and I spoke to them about that and I forget, he, the dog was registered through some kind of companion animal group. It, it was allowed clearly in the cabin. Uh, there was no problem with that. But it had been given some kind of a right uh, to be there uh, as a... An emotional support dog? Perhaps? There you go. That's it. Okay. That's it. What's the difference then between an emotional support dog and a service animal? Do so they have similar rights? Um, no, an emotional support dog does not have as many rights as a, a okay. service dog does. Um, <coughs> there, there's a lot of discussion about the difference between the dogs and who has rights and who has, um, are there fake service dogs out there? And, you know, the dogs aren't fake. The person is. Yeah. Right? The dog doesn't know what he's doing. He's, <laughs> he's where he's supposed to be there you and go. things like that. So um, ADA is very clear about it. Um, there is no certification for a service dog. Um, because ADA wanted to make sure that I didn't have to have so much money to go buy a service dog. So I have rights, um, a person who is entitled to having a service dog because of their disability can train their own service dog. So they wouldn't necessarily be affiliated with a school. So ADA is very clear on that. Um, a person can be asked questions like, um, do you ha does this dog help you with a disability? You're not allowed to ask what the disability is. That's really none of your business. And the other thing that you could ask is, you, you know, it could be asked, what are the three things that this dog does for you? Um, but, you know, to be real, we don't ask somebody what their cane does for them. We don't ask what their wheelchair does for them. But um, like a store has a certain degree of rights to make sure that they don't just have somebody walking in off the street with their pet mm -hmm. and the dog isn't entitled. The biggest concern about that is if a dog isn't properly trained, they can be disruptive, or more importantly, they could interrupt a dog that is supposed to be helping somebody. Maybe it's a diabetic alert dog that's supposed to be monitoring your blood sugar. Maybe it's an, a seizure alert dog. And if those dogs are distracted, that dog took his eye off the ball. Mm -hmm. So it's very important. The dogs are trained so that they leave each other alone, that they stay focused on their person. Okay. And, and I just, you know, it's funny that we're doing this show tonight because just, and we're taping this on May 19th. I just, at the beginning of this week, um, ironically enough, read an article where some stores are, and customers in the stores are upset because of these fake people who bring in what they think are, you know, fake service animals. And yet it does kind of put a, a store into a little bit of a quandary because you can't really ask too many questions. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what is a store owner or customers for that matter to really do? Um, and I guess, you know, if the dog's not being disruptive and the person, you know, disabilities sometimes are, we can't see them. Exactly. They're invisible. And someone may have, just because they can walk fine, doesn't, and they're not confined to a wheelchair or something, does not mean that they don't have a disability of some sort. Okay. And I think that that's one of the big things that we as a society have to get over, mm -hmm. is we can't see every disability that a person has. You know, and, and it really comes down to the, the people that um, need a service animal, um, they know that. They've worked with their doctor or a therapist and, and they're well aware of it. Um, other people, you know, we would hope that they do the right thing and they recognize the fact that while their dog is very important to them, because all of our pets are very important to us, um, that's probably not the right place for the dog. Mm -hmm. And you could interfere with another dog. So if, for instance, you don't have a well-behaved dog and let's say your dog attacked my dog who's working for me, that might end the working <coughs> career of my dog. Mm -hmm. So it's very important to be considerate of, of the other people and the other dogs 
and um, you know keep your dog where he where he belongs and where he's happiest sure I want to talk a little bit now about etiquette which you started to sort of lead into Brenda we've got a, a graphic that I, I hope we can bring up now and it shows a wheelchair and it mm -hmm. shows um, a cane and that kind of thing and hopefully they'll be able to find it but while they're looking for that no that's not it um, <laughs> it's an actual would you pet it's, I think it says, would you pet this? And there's a, a cane and a wheelchair and mm -hmm. something else. Um, it's, um, she'll find it eventually, I'm mm -hmm. sure. It's fine. But um, one of the things that I made a mistake of one time, and I shared this with you when we were talking about doing the show, is there was a, a dog and it was just laying there and I know if a dog is working, you know, y you don't pet it or mm -hmm. talk to it or whatever. I didn't stop to think that this dog was still working, even though it was just laying there and its owner um, was talking to someone else. Mm -hmm. And you gave me the best explanation. You know, I wasn't about to say, because she's very politely said to me, please don't talk to my dog. And I thought, well, okay <laughs> I you know like I was being scolded and I didn't think I was being disrespectful but I didn't want to say well why mm -hmm. you know be and not that I wanted to confront her about it but I was trying to gain knowledge mm -hmm. but I didn't want to do that mm -hmm. you gave me a very good explanation for that and please share that with our viewers because I thought it was outstanding we'll see if I say the exact same <laughs> words again <laughs> well, you kind of mentioned it already about monitoring sure. blood sugar but yeah um, so so the point would be so I don't know if you can see right now but the dog is laying down next to me she was we sleeping. can get a wide shot and right. and uh, um, so she could while we're talking and I'm not necessarily looking at her it could look like she's just the average dog that's laying there um, for a PTSD dog one of the things they're doing is they're want monitoring us to see if we become anxious and the dogs have a cue when they can possibly notice that we're being anxious. Are you going to, now you're not going to do anything. <laughs> <laughs> so what she's trained to do is if she starts reading the anxiety, the person that she's going to often bounces their leg when they're starting to get anxious. Okay. And her job is to watch for that and then take action on it when you do it right. Yes. And the action would be what? <laughs> she's interrupting me. Okay. So her job is when I'm doing this to interrupt me and distract me okay. to bring me back to move away from what I'm anxious for. Okay. But she's normally just laying on the floor with her vest on. So to the average person, it looks like any dog that's just there, even though she's working. Blood sugar would be another example, or somebody who's, um, who has a seizure alert dog. Those dogs are working even when they just look like they're laying there and they have a little bit of downtime. So the, the point on that is, um, if you see a vest on, that's the easiest way to tell that they're working. Some dogs don't wear a vest, though. Um, it is not required by ADA. If the vest, for some reason, would interfere, or you know, you see a harness instead of a vest, most people will have a vest on their dog, though, so it's real easy to tell. Mm -hmm. And the dogs certainly learn it, and they also they know it. They know when their vest comes off, they get to be a dog. At home, the vest comes off. She gets to run around the house. She gets to play. She gets to do whatever she wants to do. Um, you know, within the confines of the rules of the house, obviously. Sure. Sure. Um, but when the vest goes on, then we expect her to straighten up, and we expect her to behave well and, um, and, and not mess with the other dog dogs. Right now? This is Jazz. Jazz, actually. okay. This is Jazz. Hi, Jazz. Oh, you're gonna go greet her. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know if that was the right thing to do or not. But, you know, it's so, yeah. it's so easy <laughs> to just, it is. I mean, it those of us is. who love dogs, you see a dog, the first Back. reaction is to smile Under. at it. Mm -hmm. And when you know a dog's name, to say, hey, you know, how you doing? Mm -hmm. um, and, but that was a valuable lesson that I learned that day. And, you know, um, that's why I love doing shows like this, because, A, it's educating folks and enlightening them about things, but I'm learning at the same time. So um, let me just take a quick peek here at some of these other questions before we get into, um, you know, what the other dogs are that we have here, who they are, and what they do. Um, I know that um, you guys are working with inmates at Oshkosh Correctional yes. Facility. Um, is that the only prison that you're working at? Yes. Okay. Yep. We have 36 inmates in the program. Okay. Um, and we just started a program for the inmates with Fox Valley Technical College. They're receiving um, <coughs> education and training on small business skills. And then they work with us to practice instructing classes. So the idea is that they could get a dog trainer certificate, 
which perhaps would um, give career opportunities for them once they leave the prison. Okay. And how are the inmates selected and how are they matched up with the dogs? The inmates are picked, um, they apply, so they get pra job experience through filling out a written application. Mm -hmm. They're interviewed by officers at the correctional institution um, to, to understand what their motivation is, why they want to be in the program. They are all volunteers. They do not receive any payment for the work that they do other than the opportunity to work with the dogs. Um, they have a full-time job. They have to ha lift um, 50 pounds and have a couple of other skills that they'll make you know that'll make them successful in that program once they get through the written application and the on-site interview then they join the program for about 30 days we have a trial period where they can decide if they really like it um, if it's what they were expecting it was going to be and we can make sure that they have a good rapport with the dogs okay and from there we have men that have been in the program since the beginning so that's about three and a half years up to people who started a month ago and are there certain dogs that work better in this kind of a program or as a service dog? So we're looking for some basic characteristics. The dogs have to be calm, the dogs have to be quiet, um, and the dogs have to be interested in people so that, that they're willing to work for you because we're looking for, do these dogs are going to work, but we want the dogs to think the work is fun because when the work is fun it's not really work anymore. So we need them to want to work, we need them to have a good time, but they do need to be quiet because otherwise in public they're disruptive. So um, certainly the dogs that are in training make mistakes and they're going to once in a while bark um, and that's and it's our job to teach them that. We also look for dogs that don't have too much prey drive and by prey drive I mean they want to chase the cat. Um, they're too excited about chasing the birds and the squirrels and things like that. And the rabbits. And yeah. the rabbits. Um, because if they're placed with somebody who has um, maybe a back issue um, they can't hit the end of the leash because they're going to hurt their person or their person won't be able to hold on to the mm -hmm. leash. So um, we need minimal play, prey drive on that, but a lot of play drive. We want them to want to play with us. Sure, Just sure. Was it, was it real involved to, um, you know, get the, the prison on board with this? Um, did you have to go through a lot of the, the um, sales techniques to, to get them on board? Um, so I joined the program after they had decided they were going to do it. So I didn't work in the very first part of the program, but it took them almost a year to work through it all. And a lot of it was policies and procedures. A lot of it was, what are we going to do when we have a sick dog? Where are we going to give a dog a bath? Where are we going to get rid of the dog waste? Where are they going to stay? What are they going to do? And all those kinds of things. So. They had a lot of work to do, and they also had to make sure that the officers were willing to participate and work in the program. Right. So um, the officers at the institution um, make the entire program possible. Um, without them, we would, if, if we didn't have their support, because they help us get the dogs out of the building, Sure. Um, they are also sponsors. They, um, some of the volunteers like to work with, um, they check in on our dogs once a week and they work with making sure the dogs are progressing and they're doing well. Okay. So. Okay. We've got an over uh, overexcited dog here. Um, does he, do we maybe want to show him doing something or is sure. it her? Sure, he wants to stretch. <laughs> okay. He wants to yeah, because I mean, you know, they've been laying a while. Hi. So let's see who we have Get here. And um, now who is this? Dash, okay, and I know you just had to take your microphone off, so um, we will try to, <coughs> I'll try to repeat kind of what you're saying. So what are we going to see Dash doing? Um, uh, this one right here, I believe, is going to be picking you up, okay. number three. Oh, yep. Oh, what's... <laughs> So Dash is about nine months old. Okay. Um, we find the German Shepherds are very dramatic. Um, they talk in the beginning, and we have to help them understand to be quiet on it. Um, but they're quite intelligent. Um, they're pretty popular with some of our veterans that are, are looking to get a dog. They, mm -hmm. it's, it's a comfortable dog for them. It feels um, like something they might have worked with in the service as well. Um, so he's kind of at this in-between age right now. Um, Jazz that I have is two years old, so she's quite a bit older than he is. 
um, and he's just kind of working through things. Mm -hmm. So he, as we all are. <laughs> yeah. So he's learning pivoting. He's learning awareness of his body so that um, he's very maneuverable because he's so long. Mm -hmm. um, and then the sits and downs and things like that. He's learning to just work for somebody and follow instructions. Okay. And he's, they're all so beautiful. It's rare for me, I rarely see a pure black German Shepherd. Mm -hmm. You know, usually they look like a typical German Shepherd or you see white German Shepherds, but I have not seen a black German Shepherd in an extremely long time. Now, where are these dogs coming from? Are they being donated to you? He or? has been donated to us by um, a breeder out of Chicago. Okay. Granville German Shepherds. So um, he's one of a few shepherds we have in the program right now. Uh, we also happen to have his mother that we're giving a tryout on as okay. well. She's a, um, a retired um, dog for the breeder, and um, we think she's going to do well. But she looks identical to him, so you wouldn't know the difference. <laughs> <laughs> so. Okay. And now, who is the dog that, um, Cindy, that you have? He's, or she, is anxious to... He wants to show off. He's, that's right. His That's sure. Echo, isn't it? Yep. He, okay. The chair was on his hair. Oh. Ah. <laughs> do we want to uh, see sure. what he can do now for us? Sure. All right. Echo free. Okay, so Echo is um, an unusual breed. What kind of dog is this? Echo is a Briard. Echo. A Briard. I've never heard of that breed. It's a French herding breed. Okay. And Cindy, how old is Echo? Five months. Five months old. Wow. Relax. Relax. They tend to be um, much taller. They're a bigger boy, um, but it's almost all hair. They're mm -hmm. a very lean, lightweight dog. And because he's a baby, he's also you know just learning the basics on this stuff. Um, service dogs spend a lot of time laying and relaxing, <laughs> and so we spend a lot of time teaching them to be comfortable and to be able to just hang out. Okay. And what will what will Echo help someone do? He's targeted also to be a dog for somebody with post traumatic stress disorder. Okay. Echo, heal. All right. Excellent. Very good. Now, um, and Sherry's bringing in another dog right now. Um, who do we have here? So Chance is um, is a rescue dog for us. Um, one of the things, um, you don't tend to see um, guide dogs being rescue dogs. They tend to be purebreds that um, you have the full lineage and the full background on as far as hips, elbows, eyes, um, predisposition for allergies, things like that. We're experimenting with a rescue dog, and, and he really pulls the, the heartstrings because he's turning out to be just an absolutely great dog. Mm -hmm. um, and he's one of the fan favorites at the prison because um, sometimes they feel like, you know, they've, they've gone through similar experiences of not having a home and things like that. So um, wow. he smiles and his tail <laughs> wags all of the time. Um, he has his moments of being crazy silly, but that's okay too while he's growing up and figuring things out. Sure, sure. All right. And we were also just joined, this, this one is, this is a heartbreaker. I'm sorry. You can't help but smile oh, at this goodness. little puppy. Um, we've just been joined by Cindy. Now you're a trainer at the prison. Jenny. Yep. Uh, I'm sorry, Jenny. Jenny. Okay. Yes. Um, you're, you're the vice president, and you're the medical coordinator. I'm the medical coordinator. And look at this face. <laughs> look at both faces. They're both beautiful, but, but I'm talking about the furry one. Frost. Look at that. Yes. Who is this? This is Frost. He's nine weeks old, and he is a yellow lab. He came to us from Neverest Labs. We get some of our dogs from there, and he is a real sweetie. Yes. And may I pet him? Yes, you may. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm right. glad you asked. <laughs> yes, you may. Hello. Hello, Frost. You are just beautiful. <laughs> and, you know, he came from where? Never, never rest last. Never, never, never rest. Never rest. Okay. All right. And what will he, she, he, he, <laughs> <laughs> what will he be taught to do when he's fully trained? Uh, the same things as the other dogs. Okay. So he will be fully trained to help someone that has post-traumatic stress disorder. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. And um, sometimes, I'm assuming, these folks have diabetic issues and, and other complications. So they, 
if will he be trained or will they all be trained to monitor someone's blood sugar and all of that stuff or um, that is a very special skill okay and because of um, the nature of that skill we don't train for diabetic alert so okay. um, there are a lot of organizations that do and it's very important to be very careful that you find a dog that really alerts well mm -hmm. and has been well trained for that but um, for the nature of the training that we do, we do not do that training. Okay. All right. And then you go. So as a person who is like a medical trainer, what, what specifically do you do when you go into the prison? Um, I do health assessments on the dog. So that okay. means um, if a dog is having issues with their ears, um, I'll check the ears out, see if they need to have further follow-up with a veterinarian. Um, I check uh, if they have a stomach ache, um, rashes, mm -hmm. uh, eye problems, foot problems, uh, <laughs> pretty much the whole gamut. Sure. We, we work pretty closely with the animal hospital here in Oshkosh. Uh, they're wonderful in helping us with uh, taking care of our dogs. Sure. And, um, yeah, so I take them in when they first come in. They come in at about eight weeks old, and we go in for a vet check so the vets can meet them and, and see how they're doing. And then if we have any other issues, we call. And um, Oh, yes. And yes. he's nine weeks, nine so weeks. you've had him just a very short period of yes. time. And as I understand it, Frost actually lives at the prison. Yes. Mm -hmm. How many of them that we've seen tonight live there? All of them. They all do. They all do. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they're there 24-7. Mm -hmm. They're inmates in a way themselves, <laughs> and do they um, do they stay right with their inmate trainer the whole time? Where the inmate goes, they go, or how does how does that work? So um, the <coughs> dogs have certain areas in the building that they're allowed to go to, and um, each cell has two inmates in it with a dog. So there's a there's a pair. Usually the, um, the pair work different shifts so that there's always somebody with the dog. And then we have some additional people that don't have a dog currently assigned to them that are basically sitters. And um, they'll pick up and they'll take care of a dog when their primary people are busy. Based on the age of the dog, it decides where the dogs can go. Um, and as well as the temperament of the dog or what we're trying to teach. Some of the dogs are able to go on visitations so that the inmates can show the dogs that they're working with to their families, which is great experience for the dogs to learn to be well behaved under their circumstances. We also have a program there where the dogs are um, occasionally treated like therapy dogs and they will take the dogs that, uh, that we have, we take the vest off, we put a bandana on them, and they'll take the dogs to um, one of the other units so that um, some of the other inmates get a chance to see the dogs and see the dogs work. So that's the inmates handling a dog to show to other inmates. Mm -hmm. So there's multiple layers of help that's going on sure. or opportunity that's going on under those circumstances. Um, then in addition to that, we have our community volunteers. All the dogs come out um, very frequently. Sometimes they come out for a few hours. Sometimes it's a day. Sometimes it's longer. It's an overnight sleepover for the dog. Or sometimes it could be a week or more at a time. That's to make sure that the dogs are getting exposure to public things that they can't experience at the prison. For instance, at the prison, the dogs are never in the dark. So the dogs don't know that it's okay to be in the dark. So they need to be taken for walks in the dark. So we need volunteers who are willing to take dogs for a walk in the park at night. Um, we don't see squirrels at the prison, so the dogs need to be walked someplace where they're going to see and experience squirrels and cats and children. Um, all the things that they're going to see in the real world mm -hmm. that they can't quite experience there. Yeah, I, that was one of my questions is, you know, does living at the prison give them the wrong, them, the dogs, mm -hmm. give them the wrong idea sort of of what outside life is going to be mm -hmm. like? Um, so thank you for sharing that because that, you know, that's, it's quite a world of difference yep. between the two. Oh, yeah. And, um, and they do everything they can. There's a, there's a unit at the prison that has a small um, simulated kitchen area and a living area. And the dogs that when they're back in that area, they're off leash, they're, they have their vests off and they're just kind of living with each other and hanging out and learning how to stay out from underneath your feet in the kitchen and, huh. and how to behave yourself <laughs> when, the, when somebody's sitting and watching TV. So. And how long is the training program? Did you say it's a couple of years? Or? Yeah, so Jazz is two years old. She's, um, she's on the very last stages. Next week she'll start, um, instead of living at the prison and coming out. Oh, you're going to talk? <laughs> yeah. Instead of living at the prison and coming out for her person, she's going to live with her person and they're going to provide daycare for her. So he's not quite ready to take her to work, 
So she'll be on the opposite side. So she'll spend most of her time with him and then a little time at the prison to continue her training until he's ready to do the last steps. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is benefiting the inmates also, mm -hmm. I'm sure. Um, I think far too often we think of, as a society, inmates as doing something so horrible that they don't have any redeeming qualities. And um, in most cases, I think that's not the truth. You know, certainly there are some really bad people that we can all think of who have gone down in, you know, the annals of history um, for committing horrific crimes that I, I can't really find a whole lot of redeeming qualities. But most people have just made poor choices, bad mistakes, and they have redeeming qualities. And I just saw um, a program on CNN a few weeks back on San Quentin and how the inmates there, and that's a tough prison out mm -hmm. in California, mm -hmm. how a lot of the inmates there are working on uh, a newspaper that goes out to the community mm -hmm. of, of yes. you know, inmates and so forth. And, you know, <laughs> to hear these people talk, to see them work, to see their work ethic, Down. it's amazing, Down. you know. Um, they just made some bad choices, and that doesn't mean that they should be, you know, condemned um, for the rest of their lives. And so somehow, this is helping them also, right? Absolutely. What are they benefiting from this? Absolutely. Um, <coughs> the inmates are all, like we talked about before, they're all volunteers. Hey, right here. That's okay. Good. They're all volunteers, and um, they're doing this because they want to learn some additional skills. We have um, inmates at the prison that can groom a dog, can groom poodles, show quality poodle grooming. Wow. Um, that <laughs> They're they, hired. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, when they get out, um, that would be a great skill that they would have. They would be outstanding at it. Um, we have other men that are doing an outstanding job training dogs. Um, our clients, when they're comfortable with it, the clients actually come into the prison, and the inmates train the client. So they're getting an opportunity to show their dog off, show how to handle their dog, and working with their dog in a way that they're, it's a very positive experience. Um, when people come out of the prison, like our, um, our clients, they can't believe how much the inmates know. <laughs> they, they just talk and talk and talk about, I didn't know you should do this. I didn't know you should do that. Sometimes the officers talk about they're getting t dog training tips from the inmates. We recently had an example where UW River Falls has started a program where the students there are trying to um, raise service dogs. So they're picking up one dog each semester and they're training that dog, hoping that they can rehabilitate a rescue dog and then place it as a service dog. And they came and they visited us. We had the instructor with five students came. And part of the, what we did with them was we let them, they were able to come into the prison. They could see all of our dogs. Um, and then we broke up into small groups and the students worked with the inmates the inmates showed them how we were doing service dog training, and the students were talking about things. And at the end of that trip, we got rave reviews from them about how much they had learned and how much they had appreciated it. So it's a very positive experience when we do that, and um, we've had great luck with that. So wonderful. The men are highly, um, highly skilled. Um, they read books faster than anybody you can imagine as far <laughs> as consuming <laughs> training materials and um, applying it. So I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure. Um, and I, I don't know if we were ever able to find that one particular graphic. Um, I didn't ever see it come up, but I don't know. We got off talking on other things. But it, it goes back to service dog etiquette. Mm -hmm. And essentially it was a, um, it almost looked like a cartoon type graphic. And it had a, a picture of a wheelchair, and it had a picture of a cane. And do you remember what the other thing was on there offhand? If um, not, that's fine, too. No, but the intent on that is to talk about um, if somebody was in a wheelchair, you wouldn't go up and you wouldn't just touch the wheelchair. You wouldn't go mm -hmm. up and talk to the wheelchair. Now, obviously, it's an <laughs> inanimate object. But the same thing is true with the dogs. The dog is intended to be a piece, in some ways, of medical equipment to help me and keep me safe. Mm -hmm. uh, proper etiquette would be you could go up and look me in the eye and say, you have a gorgeous dog. That would be a wonderful thing to say because that opens a door between two people. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't come up to me and look down at my dog and start talking to my dog and act like I wasn't there. Right. Right. So that's what the etiquette really comes into play. Mm -hmm. um, com complimenting people on having a gorgeous dog or how well behaved the dog is, that does nothing but raise pride. It's no different than when I'm at home and I have a guest and a guest would say my dog is well behaved. You feel really good about that. Sure. 
So saying that to somebody in public is a, is a fine thing to do. Making eye contact with the dog, though, may be enough to distract the dog. So the idea is to talk okay. talk to the person. So don't even look in the dog's eyes. Yeah, because you wouldn't you them. know you wouldn't touch the medical equipment and mm -hmm. um, teach your kids. As, the same as I recall thing. it saying, would you you wouldn't pet a wheelchair, <laughs> you right. wouldn't pet a cane, <laughs> yeah. and and you know I thought that that drove home the point <coughs> so well, mm -hmm. uh, you know so well, it puts things in perspective in a way that and I've been around dogs my entire life. And I work with a lot of rescue groups and with the Humane Society of the United States and, and that kind of thing. But I, you know, service dogs is not something I've been around mm -hmm. all my life. So that, when I saw that mm -hmm. on your, I think I got that off your website, as a matter <laughs> of fact. And I just thought, this is, this puts it in perspective. This says it all mm -hmm. with three or four little frames. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was brilliant, mm -hmm. whoever did it. Um, <coughs> so want to um, talk about your organization but before we move on to that how do you how do you test the dogs or assess them to see if they will be suitable candidates for a program like this do you want to talk about some of the selection criteria the testing is kind of everyday life every day so life. every every day you're assessing the dog as to the quietness the willingness um, when puppies come in, they're kind of hard at first because they're very vocal because mm -hmm. they're away from their litters. So they start learning not to be vocal and learn to be with you and do what you want to do. And so it just, to keep them active and busy, you always, they want to learn new things. So mm -hmm. every day is like learning something new. Okay. Well, that you know, that's that's a good way of putting it too. Um, and you are Cindy, correct? Yes. Okay. I'm just trying to keep the names <laughs> straight. We, we got Cindy, we got Jenny, and and Brenda. So, um, and we talked about how they get exposure into you know public situations. How long of a process is that to get them exposure, leaving the prison, and then going into public? So. Um, Exposure starts from eight <laughs> weeks and a few hours. Um, yeah. When we get the dogs from the breeder, the dog, and we bring the dog into the prison, they'll start going out pretty much right away. We control where they go and who they go with so that they have a successful experience mm -hmm. on it, but they need to have social experiences right from the start. If they don't leave the prison enough, they get really good at the prison, but they aren't necessarily great every place else. Mm -hmm. People will talk about, um, my dog is really good in my backyard but it isn't very good when I take it to somebody else's house. These dogs can have the same problems, so they need to learn that wherever I am, the rules are the same, experiences are the same. It takes us about 18 months to two years for a dog to be ready to go, and that depends on the dog. Some dogs will mature faster than others, and that's okay too. Um, we have the time to give them what they need in order for them to mature. Um, Jazz goes to work with me, or has been going to work with me on a pretty regular basis, and she spends the day in the work office, and it looks a lot like this. You need to figure out how to be able to relax and lay there and not be disruptive. I couldn't take an eight-week-old puppy in to do something <laughs> like that. Right? I mean, other than everybody would be petting him and we'd pass him around. Yeah. You know, he wouldn't get that same experience. Right. So right. it's right. different stages at different ages, and as far as the dog's making it, um, we could get all the way up to the end, and a dog might be, start having a health issue. For instance, allergies might develop. So it might be the best dog. Um, it could have had all the training, but we won't place a dog um, that has a health issue with somebody because most likely a person we're placing it with doesn't have the spare fi financials to be able to take on a dog that has additional needs on it. Mm -hmm. So the dogs all have their hips done, their elbows done, their eyes examined. We just did an, um, <laughs> we just made a, a mass run with a bunch of dogs to have their eyes evaluated. Um, just to make sure that they're all growing and they're progressing. Mm -hmm. So Okay. And what is the, uh, you may know this, you may not, what is the overall cost for um, time and training um, to get these dogs ready to go? If you had to put a price tag on it, do you have any idea what that would be? Um, we can say $10,000, but I'm sure that that does not include all the volunteer time um, be it the inmates, be it the officers, be it the community volunteers that actually goes into it. But by the time you start calculating the food, the medical expenses that are associated sure. with it, the training equipment, 
um, your your ten thousand dollars is probably conservative. Mm -hmm. And when the dog goes to its its home mm -hmm. for the person who mm -hmm. it's been trained for, is it then their responsibility for maintaining care, um, vet bills, food? Yeah, that we kind place of thing? the dog at no charge, okay. so they don't pay to get a dog. Okay. Um, that is not part of it, um, but we do um, we do look to them to be able to take care of the dog. They have to be able to um, provide food, provide the veterinary care for the dog. Um, beyond that, there isn't a lot of additional expenses. We provide all the equipment for the dog for when it's placed, so they have the leashes and the vests and things like okay. that. So they're ready to go from that front. Um, yes. But you know, there, there's stuff that comes up along the way. Dogs aren't free, um, and but there's also another side of it that we follow up very closely: that the dog is being well cared for, um, that the dog is maintaining appropriate weight. Um, we don't want the dogs to get so heavy that they can't perform their tasks. That would shorten their life expectancy. Um, we do spay and neuter though, also before the dog is placed, so that would not be an expense that our client would have to bear okay. the burden on. Okay. Okay. All right. And, and so they do have the initial vetting done mm -hmm. beforehand. Yes. yes. All their immunizations are up to date. They get their rabies right before five months, so they're, they're good to go. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's just the ongoing expenses right. once right. they actually right. come into their care. Okay. Very good. Um, and what is the normal life expectancy for... I know it can range from dog right. to dog and breed to breed, but I mean, how long can someone typically expect to have one of these service animals on average? So <coughs> they will be able to keep the animal for the life of the dog, even if the dog needs to stop working mm -hmm. for some reason. If they would choose that oh. they want to provide care for the rest of the life. If a dog got to be eight years old and the dog couldn't work anymore, um, and they needed a new service dog, it would be our responsibility to take the older dog back and find him a good and appropriate home because as an organization, that's our, our responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, so you probably are going to have a dog that's going to work for you 8, 10 years, depending on the dog. Okay. This isn't highly stressful on their joints, so if they're kept in good body weight, um, you should expect to have a nice working life with them. Okay, excellent. And so they can, if the animal has to stop working, they can keep mm -hmm. the dog. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Do they sign a contract? Yes. yes. Okay. So if for some reason they can no longer keep the dog, it must be returned to, to us. You. Yes, mm -hmm. we're okay. accountable for that. When we have a dog that might not, um, might turn <coughs> out to um, be too insistent on chasing cats and isn't going to work for our, our program, um, those dogs are returned to the breeders um, because the breeders are in the best position to find the proper place for the dog. Mm -hmm. Our responsibility is the dogs while we have them and once we place them. And then we take, you know, we take care of the dogs for the rest of their life that way. Okay. I want to talk in our remaining maybe 10 minutes or so, 12 minutes, whatever it might be, about your needs as an organization. I mean, obviously, you need dogs. <laughs> if you've got 26 inmates that are, I think that's, yeah, 20, 30, 36. 36 inmates, um, do they each have a dog or do they take turn? How does this They work? have teams. Um, okay. We have... The inmates, there, there's two inmates to a cell, and in the cell then the dog is placed with them. And then we have a few inmates that are um, on standby or are called sitters, and um, they take over if the two primary inmates both have to be someplace at the same time. Um, we actually have to have times of the day that it's required the dogs be left alone, because otherwise the dogs would never be left alone. Mm -hmm. um, and then the dog doesn't know how to deal with being left alone. So. Um, we do have a lot of, you know, we have a lot of inmates that are working in the program. We are very fortunate that they're doing it. But as far as needs go, um, we use specific collars, leashes, and vests. So there's a cost that's associated with that. But as opposed to somebody donating a leash to us, we would much prefer to, um, to have any type of financial help for those kinds of things. Um, obviously, the veterinary costs are one of our biggest expenses. Um, we're fortunate the Animal Hospital of Oshkosh helps us with that, um, but you know they're a business as well, so mm -hmm. there's a cost for that. Um, gift cards help us because we'll go and we get things like treats for the dogs. Uh, these little dogs need toys. They, um, they need those kinds of things. And again, we do better um, if we can pick those out because the labs, um, 
will chew through just about <laughs> anything. Yes. <right? laughs> uh, on the other hand, the Briards don't tend to have quite as hard of a mouth. They like different toys. Mm -hmm. So we can pick out the specific toys for the dogs so that we know that the dogs are safe and they're getting adequate training. Mm -hmm. So um, we even use grocery cards. Um, one of the things the men occasionally do, we take groceries in and they create, they make their own dog treats once in a while. Okay. So um, anything like that is always a help for us. And one of the biggest things that we need, are we always need volunteers. Mm -hmm. okay. People who are interested in um, joining us, um, filling out the application online. Um, and then we work with them to do, we go out with you and we teach you how to handle the dogs and what to expect. And once you've gone through that training program and you're ready, then you can start taking dogs out on your own. Okay. And taking them out into the public mm -hmm. yes. settings. Mm -hmm. Or home. Mm -hmm. okay. um, like the little puppies like Frost <laughs> over there. Um, he needs home experience too mm -hmm. because he's going to spend his life in a house. So he needs yeah. exposure to little kids. He needs exposure to the garbage disposal and the hair dryer and the water softener. And the vacuum cleaner. And the yeah. vacuum cleaner. Yeah. So... Um, having volunteers that like to take their dogs talk to take the dogs home is great and having other volunteers who like to take them out to the restaurant mm -hmm. they need it all now restaurants I, I mean here we go um, they're service animals mm -hmm. so they're allowed in restaurants yes mm -hmm. um, the whether they've got their jacket on or their mm -hmm. vest on or not they're allowed there um, as if I were a volunteer mm -hmm. and I wanted to take a dog I would be taking a dog to a restaurant or to the grocery store mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. wherever. Church or anywhere. Anywhere. doctor's office, mm -hmm. anything like that. As long as they have their vest on. Uh, oh. We don't want to take any of our dogs anywhere out in public without their vest mm -hmm. on because when their vest is on, that means they they're are working, working yep. and they're also covered under, you know, to let people know sure. that, yes, they're service But the a and it was the ADA thing that ADA said they ADA doesn't didn't require it. Um, but you guys we do, do because do. there's yes. no reason to not wear it. Right. Right. So, I just think yeah. it makes good sense. Yeah. I saw something else on your website that going back to etiquette and um, the vest, mm -hmm. and I, I believe it said something about respect my uniform or mm -hmm. respect mm -hmm. the uniform mm -hmm. or whatever. You know, if we saw a soldier, right, we <laughs> we wouldn't go up and and touch the uniform. You know, mm -hmm. and y you guys just have good things on your Facebook page that. Um, and your website as well. They're just really, they're subtle things, but they <laughs> drive home the point. And so I really want to compliment you on that. Um, I, to be honest, I've not looked at that many service dog websites. Mm -hmm. This is the first show that I've done in 13 or 14 years of doing this on service dogs. And I'm so grateful well, to you guys for being here thank and you. for bringing all of the, uh, the hard-working dogs that you have. <laughs> Um, so I <laughs> spent a lot of time looking at different things on your site, and I really have to compliment you for it. It's, Thank it's you. well Thank done. You. Um, so, so as far as volunteers, you you need volunteers. The application they can get from the website, which I'm sure we'll be putting it up again before we sign off here. Um, financial contributions. Yes, please. And um, rather than going to Petco or PetSmart or wherever the the best place is where mm -hmm. people like to shop it's probably best to get gift cards mm -hmm. so that you can pick out what's best for them yes. and their particular breed. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very good idea. Now, um, you just participated in something called Bash for mm -hmm. the Brave yes. mm -hmm. a couple of days before we're yes. taping this. Now, it was not specifically your event, no. but you participated in it. Can you tell mm -hmm. us about that? We've got about five minutes left, um, so I want to talk a little bit about events. Yeah, it was uh, <coughs> up in Kakana. Um, we we're working with uh, Mike Crum from Suicide Prevention. Um, he works with veterans, and the veteran suicide rate is extremely high, and um, he's trying to bring more awareness to the community um, at large. He does a lot of different um, events, and so we thought that would be a great way for us to get out there. There were a lot of vets, uh, veterans that were out there, um, and it was a great way to represent. We had a lot of people stopping by to, to see the dogs and learn about them. I mean, we're trying to always get our name out there and, and what we do, and it was just another great way to get our, get our name out there. Um, Chance happened to chance upon someone who needed his assistance and um, really she, yes she what um, she was having a hard time it was very noisy um, it was uh, a little more than what she felt comfortable with and um, the, 
Chance or the, the woman? The, the woman. Okay. Um, and, and this was just someone at the event? And this was just somebody at the event. Okay. And um, Sherry was handling him and took him outside, and he comforted her without even being told what to do. He just instinctually just went over and gave her the comfort she needed and brought her back to, to a comfortable level. And uh, she even put something on Facebook about it. So she's very, oh, she was wonderful. very happy how, uh, how he just happened to be there and just made her feel so much. She, he made her feel safe. That's and uh, that's what we want to do. So it that's was wonderful. wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, you know, it just goes to show it's they're not just watching out for the people that they're trained to help. Right. And that is proof positive right mm -hmm. there. Um, what other events do you folks have coming up? in the near future, are there any? Mm -hmm. uh, we've got Pizza Ranch on Monday, the 23rd. Pizza Ranch? Pizza Ranch here in Oshkosh. Uh, we're gonna have a few of our dogs there and we will also be um, helping take orders and bus tables and wow. collect <laughs> tips and <laughs> answer questions. We'll have uh, materials there as well. Dogs um, won't be licking plates clean though, right? Well, now. I think they'd <laughs> like to, but yeah, that's kind of off. That's off task for so them. So that's um, May 23rd. Yes. Now, this show will not start airing on cable access until Tuesday, the 24th, mm -hmm. that would be. Okay. However, this will be uploaded to YouTube okay. before then. Excellent. And Another I big one we have, I'm sorry, is go um, we're going to be at the Farmer's Market on June 4th. So that's the opening of the Farmer's Market here in Oshkosh. Okay. We will be... Um, selling tacos from um, Laura Tartilla Flats. Um, okay. They are donating all the materials and we will be there selling. Um, so that's another great fundraiser for us as well. Okay. Do you have like one big fundraiser throughout the year or is it a lot of little ones? Not yet. Uh, you're working <laughs> on it though. We're working on it. <laughs> okay. If anyone has some great ideas, we are always um, open to having people assist us with fundraising ideas. So um, if anybody has anything, they can contact us. We'd be more than welcome to work with them. Sure, sure. Well, that sounds great. Um, anything else coming up? We've got the Pizza Ranch on May 23rd, Farmer's Market June 4th, and... Um, then you're selling tacos on what date? Um, that's June 4th. That's at the first Okay, that, all right. So, yes. Another that, big thing, yeah. too, people can come out and watch us collect garbage on the slide of the <laughs> <laughs> we are sponsoring the high. We are sponsoring a section of the highway. We're very excited about that. So we're going to be. That is actually this Saturday. We're going to be um, okay. collecting unused items on the side of the road. So in um, in August we'll also be um, yes. in um, Animal Hospital of Oshkosh does an open house, um, and for their open house we'll be there. Okay. Um, and then Fram donates um, the food for the the dog food for the program. And Fromm has a major event mm -hmm. in Milwaukee every year in September, okay. and we'll be there as well. And um, in between there, we'll have all different things going on. Okay. Check the Facebook page mm -hmm. and check the website. Mm -hmm. And again, if we could get that uh, website page up uh, one more time, at least before we leave, and uh, we're down to 60 seconds or just a little bit less than that. The website, again, is journeytogetherservicedog.org. There it is on your screen. And if you go to Facebook, um, it's Journey Together um, Service Dog. Just go to Facebook and type that in, and it... I think it's the first thing that comes up, mm -hmm. actually. Mm -hmm. And if you really want to be sure you're getting it, type in Oshkosh behind it. So. <laughs> all right, ladies, thank you so much. Thank you, I, thank I you for having me. I cannot thank you enough for doing this. And to all the dogs, I'm in love with <laughs> Frost. <laughs> I'm in love with little Frost, but they're all wonderful dogs. Who's not in love with a puppy, right? <laughs> Especially one that adorable. Yes. Thank you so much. And if you, you want to help out with this wonderful cause, please reach out to them. And, and get in touch in one way or another. Either fill out the application, give them a call at the phone number we've had up on the screen, and um, you know, do what you can to help with this marvelous program. That's going to do it for us. Thanks again to all of our guests. Thanks to my great crew. We've got extra staff on tonight, and we thank them all. And most of all, we thank you for being here. We'll see you next time. Until then, take care. Keep your eye on us. We've got our eye on Oshkosh. Thank you.